Welcome to Darkly Lit. We are a cult that worships the literary gods in hopes that we are immortalized in the soundscape. I'm one of your hosts, Kayla King. I'm joined by my other two co-hosts. We have Sade. Buenas noches. And David. Man, all I wanted to do was just chill out at my rich family's house and <laughs> not get caught up in all this nonsense, but they refused to give me my share at night. Oh, book name drop. <laughs> well, that's the sequel. It's my share of night. It's the selfish version. <laughs> it's not ours. It's mine. Um, Fuck you. All mine. <laughs> so if you didn't guess uh, by David's title drop, uh, we just finished reading Our Share of Night by Mariana Enriquez. What to say? Let's start with the summary. Said. <laughs> Of this 600-page book. <laughs> yeah, and I always feel like my summaries tend to be the most chaotic. Um, I did attempt to at least jot some notes down for the summary. And I'm going to try to keep it brief, <laughs> which is difficult for this book. Um, but our share of night does take us, uh, it takes us through, like, multiple perspectives, kind of traveling back and forth through the narrative's timeline. But we begin with Juan, who is uh, traveling on the road with his son, Guspar, who I think is about five uh, in this moment. I thought he was six. Six? Somewhere around there. <laughs> He's young. Yeah, still still in the right age right Yeah, now. yeah. Rough estimate. Some of the book details were a bit ago, quite a long stretch of audio ago for me so some of it is fuzzy but they're traveling on the road sometime after the unfortunate death of Guspar's mother Rosario um, and they're both grieving and along the way we learn that Juan is kind of the unwilling or very much the unwilling medium for a powerful cult who he also suspects is responsible for the murder of his wife, and Juan is working to save his son from said cult, along with two other members of what we'll just call the Order. One of them is Carolina, or Tali, who is Rosario's sister, and the other one is Estefan, um, and both of them are his lovers. Just gonna leave that. Together, uh, they're all plotting to hide Guspar from the Order as he gets older um, and arrange for Juan's um, brother Luis to adopt him. Ultimately, when Juan passes, he's hoping that Luis will take custody because um, Juan has a very terrible heart condition he's had since childhood and he knows it's going to take him sooner rather than later. Juan is also apparently just super hot. Everyone fucking loves, <laughs> wants to bang this man. Anyway, sorry, that's just... <laughs> we'll um, get into that later. At some point, so at some point my, my summary is going to get unhinged. Um, <laughs> I think for a bit at this point, we also cut to Tali's perspective uh where we get to see because juan and guspar travel to the family home that's kind of secluded in the jungly area um where the order will get together with some of like the highest members and juan is like the center of this ritual that we witness where he kind of turns into this like rather otherworldly being with like really hot monster hands (laughs) i'm sorry um, we cut to a few years later, and we're now at, like, Gaspar's perspective, and I think he's about 13. From Gaspar's perspective, we kind of get a different image of Juan. Obviously, there's still some love there, but Juan is also very dis- distant um, and at times very horribly cruel. And pretty much almost child abuse. It pretty much is child abuse at some times. But Gaspar is also is still, like, really afraid of being left alone um, without his father when he passes. We also get introduced to... To Gaspar's friends, Pablo, who has a crush on him, Victoria, and Andela, who says uh, a dog bit her missing arm off when she was a baby. And one day, when Gaspar and his friends go into an abandoned house to explore, they realize that it kind of leads to this other place, and they find a lot of weird things, like body parts on display, and Andela is taken by the house. And then, during an argument, Juan hurts Gaspar's arm very badly with some glasses glass, kind of carving a symbol into it, and Pablo has to take him to the hospital, and Gaspar kind of lies and covers for his father. From there, we uh, we go back in time for a bit to Rosario's perspective, 
and uh, we get like a really nice history of the cult, um, stuff on its earliest members, the past mediums, and we learned of the cruelty that is Mercedes, who is one of the matriarchs of the cult, and Rosario's mother. We also learn more about Florence, who is another one of the matriarchs, um, and how she tried to make her youngest son, Eddie, into a medium, but failed. We also learn that Rosario met, how she met Juan, how he was kind of bought by the cult from his poor family who could not afford his medical expenses. Um, we also learn a little bit more about Luis, uh, Juan's brother, who did try to keep in contact with Juan. And then we also move on to some time in London where Rosario wanted to get away from Juan for a bit, but then he does come stay with her. And it moves on to some time spent in London away from the cult. Juan discovers he can open doors to another place and he begins exploring this other side with those closest to him, but then they are attacked by Eddie, who Juan kills and hangs upside down from a tree within the other side. We briefly cut to a journalist who is writing her final article about her meeting with Betty, who was Andela's mother, and this is happening sometime after she disappeared in the house. Um, Betty reveals her connections to the cult, how she's Rosario's cousin, how it was Juan who, as the medium during a ritual, took Andela's arm when she was a baby, and she knows that Juan traded her daughter daughter uh, to save his son from the cult. I kind of forget where, but we learned that what he traded was for a sign, and that's what he carved into Guspar's arm when he hurt him, and that's what kept him hidden from the cult. Um, so we go back to Gus Guspar and Vicky and Pablo, and it starts off with Guspar is now living with his uncle because his father has recently passed. He's really struggling with that a little bit. He doesn't struggle more with Andela's uh, disappearance. Um, over time, he does get better, more or less. I don't know. He has some self-harm issues. But his friends are doing well for themselves. Gaspar has a girlfriend for a bit um, until it becomes very clear that something out there is looking for him and will, the, and will hurt those around him to call him out. And that is confirmed when Luis turns up tortured and mutilated and an arm with an arm in his chest. It sucks. Gaspar leaves for his family home that he somewhat remembers from childhood to meet with his grandmother Mercedes and Florence and the rest of the order that is waiting for him. They take him captive with the intent of making him into the next medium. But with his Stefan's help, Guspar does find another door to the other side, leads Mercedes, Florence, and the others, um, all the other present members of the Order, deep into the mouth that is the other side and leaves them there to die, which was, was very satisfying. Um, <laughs> and then escapes back through the door with Stefan to the uncertainty of what comes next. And that was my brief summary. I completely left out a whole lot of delicious queer content so that I could stay on track. But it also touched on a lot of like political issues that had happened in Argentina and a bit on an AIDS epidemic. And there is just a lot of good stuff in this book. That is 27 hours of stuff I couldn't get into. <laughs> that is my summary. Thank you. Well done. I tried. That was really good. <laughs> that was a, that was a very succinct summary. Yeah, and it leaves a lot for us to discuss, which is great. Thank you. I will say this book, after reading it all the way through, is one of the most tightly written novels I've ever read. Even when there's extraneous parts, it adds to the book and addresses themes and issues. Usually, if someone tries to tackle so many topics at once in a book, they don't succeed. She does. And that's astounding to me. She'll like touch on like something and then it's like so expertly woven into the narrative where yes, we're hitting like multiple serious topics, but you don't feel like, okay, why are we discussing this now? Or why are we introducing this? It already feels like it's been woven in. It's just, oh, it's just very natural how it was done. I, so yes, I, I also really am glad we chose this. Did you feel like the voice no matter who was uh, perspective it was from, did you ever feel like that just the overall voice of the story was in a weird way, very conversational, like the way that it wove between things and the way it would bring stuff up and then move on to something else. It actually felt, in my opinion, it felt very fluid, very organic. Uh, and that was really fascinating. It felt like you were listening to a conversation. At least that's how it was when I was reading it. And I think that benefited the narrative overall because as you said, it does go all over the place, cover a, a broad swath of different things. And yet somehow it all kind of either expands the characters, expands the world they live in, or importantly, back to the 
overall narrative involving the occult, the order, and the the drama involved. And I just, I thought it was fascinating how just kind of, in a way, how casual the dialogue, not not like the, the, the characters talking, but the, the way that the the narrative text came off the page. I thought that was really interesting. So there were actually moments in the book that I'm like, where are we going with this? Or, oh no, I feel like this isn't going to work. One example, so early on, we realize Juan sleeps with both men and women. And then later on, we learn Rosario is also bisexual. And the last extremely long book I read, strangely enough, everybody was a lesbian in this novel. I, I won't get into too many details. It was a good book, but I was like, wow, it just feels like everybody's gay in this. This is weird. So when I first read it, I'm like, oh God, is everybody bisexual in this? But to make Gaspar straight and keep him straight, I was like, okay, that's good. And then create a drama between, not drama, but some tension between him and Pablo. Pablo will always have this unrequited love for Gaspar, who loves him, but unfortunately doesn't love him the way he wants. I don't know. It just... It builds character. It makes, it feels real. I think, does it add much to the central story? I don't think so, but it makes these characters feel real. It makes them feel human, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It makes me feel for Pablo. It makes me feel for Gaspar. It makes me feel for uh, Vicky and yeah. everybody. I actually really liked, that was one of my favorite sections of the book, was just when it was the kids and them all having to deal with this, the weirdness going on in the neighborhood and you know Gaspar having to deal with Juan and all of his seemingly like violent mood swings but in the background because we know we know we're kind of picking up oh he's doing what he's doing because it's all a lead up to him a finding Rosario's spirit which is done off camera so to speak and you know getting that that handled because I know he has a conversation with Steven about it uh, but also the steps he has to go through in order to ward Gaspar from the order and I thought that whole section was just deeply fascinating. And it's like you said, when we started reading certain sections, you like wonder how it connects, like the whole thing with the Zanyartu pit. Yeah, I and was like, where are we now? What is happening? Who I is mean, this person that's speaking? I mean, by this point, the author had earned my trust enough that I was curious to see where it go. And as slowly it started to get revealed that it was tying back to the jungle, to the resistance with mm-hmm. Betty, with Eduardo, and with Andila. I just thought that that was cool. And then, of course, the fact that that article then got brought up as a plot point because Marita finds it, gives it to Gaspar. Gaspar finally puts it together and is like, I have to do something. I have to literally push everyone away because everybody could get hurt this way. This was... See, I'm already losing track of the timeline because I'm trying to remember this before after Luis is essentially ritually tortured. Before, because Luis was kind of like that the final straw of like, I have to get away from these people these people, because they're going to go after more of the my loved ones if I don't. Right, right. But I was trying to remember if he, he essentially said he kicked Mar- Marita out before or after that happened. The the article was the reason uh, he kicked her out. Right. Mm-hmm. I was just trying to remember where in the timeline. A lot happens, and I'm surprised I'm ke- keeping track of it as well as I do. But it's, it was like the way I was reading it, because I was trying to get it done on time, it was almost at a feverish pace. Yeah, yeah, same. Man, that was a really good way to read it in an odd way, because it... It did want make me want to keep reading. So one of the things I've noticed, because I actually lis- listened to both the audiobook and I read um, the ebook, because I got both off of the Libby app. And to make sure I could finish this book on time before the recording, I would listen to it and then like move the pages to the ebook and be like, okay, where do it? <laughs> okay, start reading and then listen on a car ride to work. And I noticed in the audio, for example, I think it, she says uh, Andela, but it's spelled A D E L A. Yeah, there's no no N in there. No. And then in the book, it, it's spelled S T E P H E N. So for a while, I was like Stephen, and then it's like, oh, Esteban. Some people refer to him as Esteban. Well, but... there's a point where uh, he went by Esteban, and. I did not realize until the very end that Esteban and Steven were the same person up until he started talking with Gaspar. And I'm like, oh, fuck me, of course. Because I was like, there is a point where I'm like, who's this random lover that (laughs) Juan picked up? Well, there was was a line where it was like, when he's in London, he goes by Steven. When he's in Argentina, he goes by Stefan. In the Uh... book, it's actually E-S-T-E-B-A-N. Like Esteban. Interesting. So, By Stefan. Yeah. Esteban. And, and then there was one point in the book where it's, sw- because <laughs> I, I, it was when I was reading it, it switches like Esteban did this, Steven then do this. And I'm like, 
Why would, and I think that's the translation, mm. not the writer's fault. But uh, to I'm be, like, uh, yeah. translator, why would you do this to me? To be fair, I think it is translated very well, though. I it, mean, it obviously, is. in all honesty, for the most part, yeah. it is. But it was that one part that I was like, "Why would you do yeah. this?" That is interesting. So one of the things I want to bring up is uh, the fact that I, I'll admit I had very little knowledge about Argentina's history before reading this book, and I had to look into it and did a little bit of research. It, it is kind of fascinating when uh, people were being taken. That was considered the dirty war, and. So all the things that are happening in the book are things that do happen in real life. Of course, I knew about the uh, hippie movement as well as the AIDS crisis, but parts of Argentina's history I had to look up. Well, it did help us learn a lot. I mean, I, did, I had no idea there were so many things involving dictatorships, military coups, resistances, protests, and to, it was like a time capsule and a way to look into the complicated and tumultuous history of a country that admittedly i wouldn't have known had i read a book like this or maybe not have known unless i deliberately studied it so you were giving me information too that i thought uh helped give more context for what's going on here having that all be the framework around which this story about a much more and and again it it serves the story people disappearing during the dictatorship served the order pretty well because if they made people disappear for the sake of their occult rituals uh who's gonna notice or like the kids who are uh, being tortured and starved I, in Mercedes' dungeon. I mentioned so much about how in our last novel we read, like, oh my gosh, there's so many trigger warnings. Boy, howdy, I think this one talked. <laughs> <laughs> Although this didn't really get to me like the other one did, but I think it's because this one's m- more... It separates you a bit more than the other one where it's first person. It's, it's a much more personal story in Earthlings. This is different people over lot, over long periods of time. And you get snapshots and, and, and returns to different lives. And I think just the cruelty and immoralness of the Order and they're just everything is a means to an end so we can have immortality and the things that they do. It's that kind of banal indifference, that kind of evil indifference that like you don't exactly become numb to, but it's what you expect from a cult. And I'm not usually someone who enjoys cults as like the focus or the main villains or something of a story because I find that they oftentimes are portrayed in a very tired fashion. Not so here, because I feel like it's also a commentary about how fucking evil the rich are. (laughs) I second that. Yeah. Fuck the rich. Yeah, fuck the rich. Also, Mercedes is the most evil creature in this whole fucking novel. Oh, without a doubt. And I'm glad she died, or at least was eaten by the darkness. I do, I did really appreciate that how, like, at the end, because of the fact that Juan did, like, mutilate her face, she was, like, pretty much next to just, like, this inhuman monster, like, both, like, in appearance and as a person. So I thought that was very fitting. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Did you all also appreciate how over time we kind of got to learn who the heads of the Order were, and it was like a coven of witches essentially it was just tying into those mystical themes because you had Anne, Florence and Mercedes as kind of the the Hecate trio in a weird way and I thought that was interesting except Anne basically didn't do anything (laughs) it was all Florence and Mercedes Anne was just kind of there in fact Anne's nowhere to be found in the last part of the story just it's just Florence and Mercedes who are there yeah I thought maybe I had missed a detail that she like kicked the bucket or something maybe she had and we just don't know it there's I will say as satisfying as this ending is it is really bittersweet, and it does leave a lot of loose ends. I, they're not dissatisfying loose ends, because by nature of the story being about the occult and the supernatural, there's a lot of stuff that we will never know. Mm-hmm. There's stuff that Juan kind of understood, but is never revealed to us. And we kind of get, we, we scratch the surface when it comes to the darkness and the other place and stuff like that. But we never get a complete picture. But there are these tantalizing little loose ends that don't get brought up, like... You know, we don't know what's going to happen to Gaspar now that he's basically cut himself off from everybody, but he wants to go back to the other place to kind of right this wrong and find his lost friend slash cousin. We don't know what happened to Tali. Get a sense that she's out there somewhere. We don't even get really a clo- any closure uh, with her, per se, or, or Stefan, or one little thing I thought was going to come up but didn't really come up uh, after was the fact that Juan had that little uh, effigy, that little figure of San La Muerte uh, sewn into the skin of his shoulder. I I thought that was going to come up in the plot somewhere later in the line and have a payoff. Maybe I missed it. No, I don't think it came up again. Yeah. I don't remember it coming up again. It was an interesting piece of like folk magic that I wanted to see have some sort of payoff. I don't know if it did. 
but there's a lot to parse with this story. <laughs> one of the things um, that's very fascinating is, one, the way Juan does treat Gaspar, because... He does. It is child abuse, what he does. But I feel like some of it is from love or because he really cares about his son so much that he wants to protect him. But there's moments like the fact he slapped his six-year-old because he was crying that I did not find okay and mm. unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it just goes to show he's a flawed individual. And also, this is someone who is literally communicating with a force of primal darkness. And, it's mm. get, and all mediums who interact with... I mean, the order word can't be entirely trusted but all mediums eventually go crazy that's so, true then you can see that wearing on juan and the only reason juan is able to make any of this work the only reason i think he's able to keep things together and it has the the space the time and the ability to enact this plan to save gaspar is because he has a heart condition and he's sick Mm-hmm. I think that's interesting when that sort of thing is played as a strength and played as a as a device for the reason the order can't monitor him to the extent that or, or uh, even use him in the same way that other mediums have been used over the years that like gets revealed over time. So while none of the stuff that he does is necessarily acceptable, I can't entirely condemn him because again, this is a man who has been psychologically effectively psychologically abused and tortured his whole life and is doing what he can and he's still human he's still flawed and he's also a conduit for a force of primal unknowable uh darkness so yeah (laughs) with as as say describes it hot monster hands you know i love me some hot monster hands i like a good good chunk of my characters tend to have them (laughs) and then stefan now has a scratch from those monster hands (laughs) not to mention a bite on his neck from when uh (laughs) Gaspar was briefly possessed by his own father. Yeah, man. Oh my but, God. Okay, should we get into like favorite characters? Because him and Pablo are obvious favorites for mine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The the character that actually got the most pity from me was Eddie. Same. Once I started reading more about Ed- Eddie's perspective during the 1960s part, I my heart just felt for him. I'm like, this is this is awful. That's impressive too, considering later he shotguns a bunch of people to death. People that are not necessarily evil. But, like Laura didn't have to die. I liked Laura. I mean, it's the same thing with like, as you mentioned, with Juan, how Juan has been driven crazy by the darkness because of his ability. Eddie was for basically pushed to be a medium, even though he wasn't one, to the point of being abused and it did affect his mind so it wasn't really yeah. in the right mind space so the, the tragedy and the tragedy with eddie is that he wasn't pushed there because of the darkness he was pushed there because of the order he was yeah. pushed there because his mother allowed him to be abused and psychologically traumatized and it did bring him a connection to the darkness to a limited degree but not in the same way that a natural medium would and so there's also that there's that feeling of inadequacy so yeah i even though like the part to me that was horrific was the idea of him going through the house with a shotgun and uh, systematically just killing people Mm -hmm. as he as he made his way up that was tense that was really scary my favorite characters uh so so for you it's i think uh stefan is very likable as well. He's one of mine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also liked Louise a lot too. Oh, Louise. Yeah, he was he's a good man. He is very good. Oh, man. <laughs> it was definitely like a kind of bittersweet contrast of just like the patience that he had for Gaspar compared to Juan. Like the example that Kayla had of like he slapped the six year old because he's just because he's crying. Obviously, at this point, Juan is you know exhausted and you know grieving and frustrated, but still, Luis never was just so good with him, and his death was probably the part that hurt me the most. The whole book, I was just like, that is not fucking fair. Like Luis did not deserve that. And then to find a baby's arm in his ch- Jesus Christ. Oh, okay, here's my question to you guys: Do you think it was Andela's missing arm? I don't. Or was it just some poor child's arm? I'm with you. I'm thinking it was just some poor child's arm and it was a message. Yeah. It was clearly just there as a message. I wouldn't be surprised they just callously took an arm from some kid Mercedes had kidnapped and slapped it into... Oh, this has Mercedes written all over it. Oh, it's absolutely Mercedes because she specifically confesses. She's like, I killed him. And she was like so quick to admit it. Like she's, she's like giddy to admit it. Like this bitch was like so proud of herself over this fact. Oh, it's so sick. She's like one of the most vile characters I've ever come across. 
She is like the definition of sadistic. Okay, I wouldn't really say this about someone, but she is the definition of a, the, the C word. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I can say this on this podcast. I mean, if you're reading this book with us, I'm pretty sure we can say... She's an absolute cunt. Let's be honest. She's a <laughs> fucking absolute cunt. Thank you. Agreed. 100% a cunt. I really grew to like Rosario as we got to know her. It was really interesting to see a perspective of someone who was raised by the Order and flawed in the sense that she she has having a hard time getting that disconnect mm-hmm. from them. Mm-hmm. Seeing her perspective, seeing her relationship with Juan... And with, you know, other people that we, we grow to be fond of later. And we there, there's so much of her that just feels like it becomes an afterthought by the... Not because she is an afterthought, not deliberately, but like... My biggest disappointment is that we didn't see if or and how she was freed, her soul was freed, outside of the book. She deserved better. <laughs> I kind of wish that we had a little bit more of Rosario. I'm glad we did have the chapter that we did. But it is unfortunate that we couldn't see her again somehow. Or... Yeah, that's how I feel. Those are our favorite characters. I'm going to bring up this. This book is also very horny. (laughs) (laughs) Holy Uh, shit. Yeah, no, this was my my perfect level of just like horny. (laughs) I'll just leave it there. Comfort horny? I don't know. This got some really dark topics. Got a little bit of the supernatural. We got some queer subplots. We got some gruesome scenes. We got some some steamy scenes. I was like, yeah, okay, this... This is my book. Most of them are gay. Yeah. Most of them are extremely gay. I read queer subplots in like the books, like review summary thing that I like kind of settled on like when I was looking to like, what do I want to pick this book? I was like, queer subplots. Okay. There might be one or two gay characters. Great. Let's, let's go. (laughs) I was pleasantly proven wrong. You can say a lot about the order and we have and how fucking vile they are, but at least they're not homophobic. <laughs> the only saving grace about the order. <laughs> now, you guys should hook up with someone of the same sex because the holy androgene. It's it's <laughs> We encourage you to have partners of but don't, don't love, don't get love involved. Love is impure. Love gets in the way of what needs to be done, but sex, sex is fine. Here's the funny part. Nobody has said this, but I I imagine someone would probably come complain about the photographer returning later on and like oh what are the chances of that you do not understand how small the queer community is <laughs> and how connected everybody is <laughs> i can assure you the the chances of a queer photographer hooking up with a younger queer man that just happens to be best friends with the, this boy he met when he, he was six who his father that same photographer also slept with yeah I believe it. Weird things have happened. Can I just say I completely forgot about the thing with Andreas until it was way too late. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. They totally fucked in the grocery store. (laughs) Actually, one thing that got brought up when Sade was giving the summary a little earlier was talking about how hot everyone thinks Juan is. (laughs) And by contrast, how hot everyone thinks Gaspar is. What is it with these Petersons, man? I mean, Luis also had a little bit of his brother's looks, too. Yeah. I don't know. That's Maybe it's just genetics. Because you would think, I don't know, maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's, like, this weird sixth sense of knowing, oh, there's, like, this aura or this, like, weird vibe from this person and I'm drawn to it kind of thing. Or is it possibly not even the person, but, like, the darkness, like, pulling you towards this person so that when it can feed, it can feed. Oh. Okay, I hadn't thought about that, but that's good. That is good. Yeah. Like, there's an allure besides just the physical perceived physical beauty of these individuals and particularly of Juan. Maybe they're like you and they just sense the monster hands inside. (laughs) Yeah. Do we want to get to questions? Yeah, let's do, let's go to questions. I mean, uh, that'll help encourage more discussion for sure. So I was surprised we did get questions because I know how long this book is Mm. and I wasn't sure if many people would follow along, but longtime listener Bringer actually did provide questions and read the book. Thank you, Bringer. Way to go for reading it with us. I, Thank you, Bringer. <laughs> I want to apologize to everyone else. I like don't regret choosing this book. I do wish I had chosen it for next season where we all would have had six months to read it. Yeah. <laughs> but just to quickly add on, if say you don't you didn't get around to finishing the book or any other books this season in time for the episode. I think we can always take time at the end of an episode to answer questions on past books if someone still wants to send them in or just post them in the discord and if we're we're around we can just discuss it there in the discord 
might probably be better. Oh, hell yeah. In that case, since we're bringing up the Discord, um, if you want to join us in our book talks and uh, want to get questions to us more easily, feel free to donate to our Patreon. Currently, it's patreon.com slash Midnight Marinara. We're eventually going to shift it over to being the general creative horror Patreon. We'll be getting to that probably around uh, late October, November, as we move forward with some new stuff, some new plans. But if you want to be part of the Discord, uh, you can join there. Any dollar level, any donation amount. And that makes you part of the Discord and part of the discussion. And there's a lot of good discussion that takes place there. And we talk about other books, too. It's not just the books that we all read. The book discussion there has been pretty good. Oh, um, yeah. So one of the questions Bringer said, Hold up, did this book just casually drop that his mom knew David Bowie and were good friends? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was cute. <laughs> and then later on, uh, she talks about this her friend David, and then it clicked. I'm like, oh, she's talking about David Bowie. <laughs> well, I like that it also implied that Rosario slept with David Bowie casually, which, which is fun. I mean, is that really surprising? It doesn't surprise me at all, especially in the 60s when this took place, but yeah. <laughs> Bringer also asked, would you join the Order? Fuck no. 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 <laughs> not even to transfer my consciousness. That's barbaric. It, it's not worth it. It's not even remotely worth it. How was the order able to get around the ultimate spell you know that's a good point and i think a lot of it was because juan didn't take into account that the order would find ways to eventually weasel out who was close to gaspar and then torture them and find ways to get gaspar to come to them yeah no because the way juan explained it was that the order would never be able to go to gaspar but if he wanted to go to them he could yeah so i think for them they kind of always knew where at least luis was because it probably wouldn't be that hard to find luis and then maybe even Vicky and Pablo once that brief news news coverage of Adela missing, right? Yep. But it, with the article and the photo and just, I think they were just kind of like putting out bait that eventually would spark Gaspar's interest that either if he would like catch onto one of these threads and it would lead them to the cult or eventually they would just, you know, mutilate Luis and call him out that way. But I think it's like a multitude of just like setting you know the stage for him to eventually come to them we realized that juan was totally prepared for that he left that plan with um estefan of like finding a door and using that to just put an end to the order Mm -hmm. just as much as the order is able to kind of patiently craft and wait and bide their time Mm -hmm. you can see that juan was thinking the same way as was stefan to make sure that they had this and so that's why that's why i think the the ending is so satisfying when they finally use the other place this thing that they'd kept a secret for so long from the order to defeat them or at least the leadership it's so satisfying despite the fact that the ending feels so open-ended I love that. It was such great comeuppance, and it felt so earned. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He also asked, why did the Order wait so long to attack Gaspar? I think we kind of addressed that, uh, because they needed to find ways to get around the lack of tracking and also find a way to convincing bait. What is the other side? And then also, building on the rules of the other side, is it possible that Juan could have closed the place of power like he did in the hospital or in London? Uh, well, I mean, he managed to close off the one in the house, the abandoned house, after everything happened, of course. But yeah, we don't really know what the other place is, do we? I don't think we're really meant to know. Yeah, I feel like we could safely say it's connected to the darkness, but we didn't really talk much about what the other place entails. But man, the the, the macabre symbols, the imagery, the dreamlike atmosphere of those, I really enjoyed the almost House of Leaves quality that was the other place Mm -hmm. kind of like that it's ambiguous that we don't know anything about it we don't know why it is or what it is and i I love that kind of supernatural occult ambiguity in stories so that was one thing that definitely run me uh, won me over with this particular novel Mm -hmm. and the world building yeah the most that is explained to us is that it's a mouth so I don't know, maybe it's a mouth of the darkness, another form of the darkness it, that it maybe normally takes. Um, and this is just a mouth. I was kind of just picturing it like that as like just some enormous entity or beast. And what they're seeing as like rooms and hallways and jungles and swamp is just going through the organs of what is this entity. Yeah, that's a really neat way to think of it too. That's kind of what I was at. Like I can almost just be what they're projecting onto the, the other place rather than what the other other place actually is mm-hmm. does it make sense that he never warned gaspar that his crazy family would come after him yes because he wanted to protect them 
from his family, but he also knew that he knew how curious Gaspar was as a kid, and he knew that the curiosity would lead him back to the family, and then it just ensnare him. That's how I feel. And also, a lot of the rituals, he said, had to be done through cruelty. That's just the way that the darkness works. So if he explained a bunch of this to Gaspar, it wouldn't have the same effect. That's true. I didn't think about that. Like, if he understood the reason why he'd hurt him, would that weaken its effectiveness? I think also part of it, like, with Gaspar being so curious, if he had, you know, explained some things even the most minor of things to him early on, would that have sent him looking for the cult sooner than later when he, you know, wasn't going to be at a young, fit age that he could, you know, outmaneuver them or something? Right. I think to Juan, he thought, oh, if Gaspar is as curious as he is as a child, if I tell him, he'll want to go. That's what he believes. Even if it is true or if it's not true, that's what he believes and that's the main reason why he did not tell Gaspar. It could honestly just have been a hope of maybe he'll never think to go looking for them if I just don't tell him anything. You know, just kind of like a blind hope as a father. Another thing too is he kept mentioning that he wanted to live a normal life or have a normal life and have a child and raise a family. And I think he wanted that for Gaspar to have a normal life or feel like he had a normal life Mm -hmm. as normal as it could be Mm -hmm. under the circumstances by not knowing he just thinks the world is fairly normal despite the fact that he sees ghosts and stuff like that (laughs) how do you all feel about the plot twist of finding out that uh adela and betty are a part of the cult they were hinting at it the whole time so that wasn't a surprise yeah, it wouldn't. I, I knew there was some connection when they brought up the enigma that was uh, Andela losing her arm as a youth, and we they had talked earlier, especially in the bit where because you have that one brief chapter where it's just from uh, Doctor Bradford's perspective. We didn't really talk about Doctor Bradford, but Doctor Bradford gets that whole section where it's his own internal monologue as he finally gets eaten by the darkness in one of the ceremonials. Mm-hmm. And he talks about how he sees the darkness snatch pieces away from people. And I think it even references that he, seen, he saw it happen to a child at one point. That, that was important because that got brought up later. But again, I didn't think much about that chapter because it was just, <laughs> you kind of forget about Dr. Bradford after a while. Yeah. <laughs> and that part went by so quickly compared to all the other sections. Oh, yeah. Did Pablo and Vicky get their powers from being with Gaspar when he went into the house? I don't think he got them from Gaspar. I think they got affected by the house, though. It, it was something the darkness gave them. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I think even, with him, maybe it was Vicky who had that internal monologue or just thought of um, the, how the house did take something from them as well. Like for, for Vicky, for example, maybe it was her empathy. That's why she can't have empathy towards her patients. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what it would have been for Pablo. I may have missed that. But yeah, no, there was there was kind of this explanation of like the house did take something from them. I mean, it could also tie in with the fact that remember when there's that scene where Pablo goes to the theater where gay men hook up. Oh, yeah. And then they go into that basement and he starts seeing these visions of horror. I felt like there was a connection there and it has something to do with what the house left him with. Mm-hmm. Isn't... Pablo's superpowers, he'll never get AIDS. Essentially, yeah. I don't think it's that specific, but I think it is the reason why he won't get AIDS. There's probably more to it than that. Maybe Pablo just can't get sick in general. It's fascinating that, like, Vicky has a very specific power. She can give diagnosis and know correctly. Pablo's... It's kind of hard to know with Pablo. I feel like, yeah, he can't get sick, but that's not as well defined as Vicky's ability is. I thought Pablo's gift or, like, exchange with the house was his, like, creativity. Or, like, just this unending creativity for his project. Oh, that's true. He does become more and more... Yeah. It's uh, Vicky's di- uh, being able to diagnose patients that is kind of building her reputation. And for Pablo, it's his creative work. Oh, that's true, because he's able to use it. Where I think what the house took from Pablo is maybe this hand that is this haunting him. Mm, that's true. It is funny because they do talk about how each of them were affected differently. Yeah. Him is the hand. For Vicky, it's... You know, not being able to sleep without socks. You know, the fear of blackout. Possibly also her lack of empathy for people. Yeah, it's a good point. I don't think we can narrowly define what the gifts are entirely and what they've lost. Honestly, the fantastic ambiguity of this story. He also asked, was this somehow Juan's plan? I don't 
think so. I don't think he had thought about the kids going into that house. No, it was his intention, wasn't it? I think it was his intention for uh, Gaspar. Gaspar. For Andela. Adela and Gaspar, but not Pablo and Vicky. Yeah. I mean, I think he knew that obviously Pablo and Vicky would probably tag along. I don't think he much cared what would happen to them. No. Yeah, it was more important that Adela get taken by the house so that that final revelation could be given. Uh-huh. And he also said, I enjoyed this book a lot. I'm glad you did, Bringer. I think we all did. Mm-hmm. This was a good read. Thank you for pitching this one to us, Sade. Yeah. I'm glad I found it. <laughs> this is two for two right now with our selection of books. Our Share of Night was so beautifully written. And I again, like I said, I've never seen a book address so many topics and handle so many different ideas and themes and do it well. I wish I would have given myself more time to read it and fully enjoy it more rather than try to speed read it as much as I can to get it done in time. Yeah, that was probably our biggest setback is that we we definitely didn't have the time to really properly digest the book. I definitely want to... uh, I know you guys picked up a copy. I went with the Audible version, um, but I think if I do pick up a copy of this book, I'm going to get the the original Spanish version. Ooh. Because there were were parts in the the narrative where I, I appreciated that it was... You go with the Spanish when they was trying to describe like, you know, how I can't think of like an example, but they're like, oh, this part was they said this in English. But obviously we're listening to it or reading it in English. Um, but there were parts where it, it made sense to have the Spanish still. So I really would like to read it from the other side. I think that'd be really cool. I, I, this is a book I will probably read again at some point because I think it's fascinating because of what we learn as we go along to go back, read it from the beginning, knowing what you know at the end. And then see what else you can pick up. Mm-hmm. Definitely one of those books. Yeah. It's going to stay on my bookshelf, I'll tell you that much. Mm-hmm. So, here we are. And uh, now, uh, as we move into September, or well, August into September, we are going to be doing one of mine next, actually. Yes. Uh, our next book will be Theme Music by T. Marie Vandilly. It has a very interesting premise. I'm curious to see how that goes. Yeah, If you want to get caught up with some of the descriptions and some of the things you're reading ahead, you can go back and listen to our trailer or even the discussion we had before this season started. So I highly recommend you go back, listen to some of those archives. Definitely check out some of the other podcasts we have on the Creative Horror Network, shows like Midnight Marinera and The Witching Hour, uh, Jameson Tapes, Trick or Track, Undercooked Analysis, and who knows, more in the future. Well... This has been a a wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining me to our first cult meeting. (laughs) No, no. Please blow out the candles on your way out. And um, if you uh, see the darkness, give them a wave. Uh, I can't blow out the candles on my hand of glory. That would be just bad news. (laughs) Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinera, and this podcast is part of CreativeHorror.com, a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at CreativeHorror.com. <laughs>